Hello, Oakland County EMS providers. Welcome to section three of the protocols that are going to be implemented on February 1st, 2024. For this session, we have Dr. Steve McGraw, our medical director, Bonnie Kincaid, our executive director, and myself, John Toit, the EMS system manager. This is section three, 3.1. Three Dr. McGraw has joined us with Bonnie and myself. Hello, John. Hello, Bonnie. Hello, Hello Dr. McGraw. We are so glad to have you to go through section three, our adult treatment section. Let's start off with 3.1. What's the big changes in 3.1? Well, you see the additional statement there at the top for patients less than or equal to 14 years of age. It refers them to pediatric altered men's status section 4.4. For the treatment protocol. Most of the protocol is actually quite intuitive. There's the additional consideration for patients demonstrating signs of hypoglycemia. Remember pallor, diaphoresis, hypoventilation, shock, checking an AccuCheck and then making certain that if you find them to be hypoglycemic, you refer them to uh, the treatment in diabetic emergencies 1.100. I also think that it's handy if you look at number eight, patient not only not alert, but is diminished mental capacity and responsiveness and not known, you can also consider things like ingestions of substances and all the things you see in AEIOU tips, chess. Please, instead of trying to remember all of that mnemonic, just think about the things that people ingest. You all have very good common sense. You can often smell alcohol in their breath. If they've left a note and they've taken an overdose of a particular substance, many of those can alter fermentation especially all the sedative hypnotics and benzodiazepines. But really the ones I want you to focus on are the things that you can do something about. A lack of oxygen causing hypoxia and altered mentation, give them oxygen, ventilate them. An excess of carbon dioxide from their opiate overdose. Yes, you're going to reverse the opiates, but in the meantime, ventilate them, lower their CO2 and they'll start waking up even before they get the Narcan. Remember, the opiate puts them to sleep and causes their breathing to stop, but it's the not breathing that kills them. Things like certain ingestions that we have to worry about, maybe there's other medications that they've taken to excess, certainly those can cause altered mentation. But if they're not the kind we can intervene on, just support their life. Oxygen, ventilation, and getting blood to circulate round and round. My, my three rules, air goes in and out, blood goes round and round, oxygen is good. Do those three things on any of these altered mentation. If they're hypovolemic and a hypoxic, giving them oxygen and IV fluid will make them wake up before they get to the hospital. Think of the last patient you took care of with like a urinary tract sepsis. By the time you guys give them a liter of fluid, the, the eyes are open, they're looking around when they get to the hospital. Yet you did that because you made more oxygen and blood circulate to their brain. It didn't stop their sepsis, but you did all the things necessary so that we, can pick up from you guys and then then treat their infection. So the sum total I have this, none of this protocol it, to me is really that bothersome. I love the addition of the diabetic emergency. And then when it comes to the etiology or the causative agents, just remember you can intervene on a lot of people because many of the things that any of these agents cause will result in hypoxia, hypovolemia and lack of circulation or combination of both and just treat those and you'll see improvement before your eyes. Excellent. So the next protocol is 3.2, and this is one that we all like as providers. Nothing has changed, so Yay. everything is pretty easy for us to, to remember. This was the training for 2023, so all of you should be in tune with this protocol and the stroke severity scales, and there'll be more to come on that in the future. They just remember too, when you guys are doing that Cincinnati stroke scale, you've already done three fifths of the fast ED basically. And you look at the last two categories, really be careful with the family and help them understand what we mean by last known well. If it meant that it was the night before they talked to them on the phone, that's the last known well. Because if they woke up in the morning and the symptoms were already there, that's really important information for us. We'll do different tests. We'll do different types of imaging. If it turns out they were alert and active with no problems after they woke up and then sometime after that, the symptoms manifested themselves, that's critically important too. That's a much more proximate, time-sensitive ability to administer thrombolytics. And you guys are right there to have us 
had that conversation with the family. Thanks to you, we get really good direction on which modality is best for the patient. So respiratory distress 3.3, we get back into some changes. What are your thoughts, Dr. McGraw? Well, we saw again the pediatric referral, which is fine. But as I've said before, I think some of this is a distinction without a difference. If you suspect someone is volume overloaded, their neck veins are distended, there's a lot of peripheral edema, and you're suspecting more like cardiogenic pulmonary edema, you will know because many times when you listen, they sound gurgly like that coffee percolator that we always hear. Those patients get a lot better with CPAP. When you put it on them and give them high flow oxygen, you've seen them pink right up, their skin gets a little bit better. We give them nitroglycerin if their blood pressure is really high and their left ventricle will just suck the lungs dry. It's amazing. You guys do that really routinely. Down towards the bottom, we get a little bit more of a concern about if we're giving a nebulized treatment to someone who has an asthma COPD exacerbation. The thinking now is to give that first treatment without atrovent. According to the state protocol, we're to try a first dose of albuterol on its own, and then any subsequent treatments, you can give atrovent. Be that as it may, just giving a treatment is a big difference when they're very much fatigued and they have bad end-stage asthma and COPD. Also, we have the epinephrine policy in our MCA that I'm very proud of for both MFR and BLS. And you guys know how to do that, and you know if your agency is permitted to do that. We also support the use of prednisone, 50 milligram tablets, for adults and children with asthma COPD over the age of six. The sooner those anti-inflammatory antihistamine effects start to work, it'll be better for the patient when they arrive to the hospital. We have in the past and continue to recommend if prednisone isn't available or the patient's under six years of age or can't take oral medicines, you can always give cyamedrol, methylprednisolone, 125 milligrams to a normal weight adult and two milligrams per kilogram, up to 125 milligrams for pediatrics. Otherwise, the remainder of it is very similar and what you all have gotten very good at, treating respiratory distress. So the next one is 3.4, seizures. Again, this one seems to have a few more substantive changes. Yeah, and then there's a couple of things to be sort of bolo as a police say, be on the lookout. The disclaimer at the top for directing you to pediatric seizure management is but we in this country have seen a growth in the number of women with pregnancy who are presenting at times with uncontrolled hypertension, which will lead shortly to altered mentation and seizures. It's something that we've become very aware of in the emergency department. Because of that, we're asking you to join us in having a level of suspicion. Preeclampsia or eclampsia, and the difference is preeclampsia is the high blood pressure. Eclampsia is when that high blood pressure leads to seizures and altered mentation in pregnant women really doesn't begin in early pregnancy, but rather the second half of pregnancy, but is actually even more common in that immediate postpartum one to two to three weeks, up to six weeks after delivery. And they won't have a history of seizures, but their blood pressure comes completely out of control. They get altered mentation and seize. The treatment for them, yes, is benzodiazepines, true, but to prevent their seizures from continuing, we have to give them large doses of IV magnesium. And that's why you have extra magnesium now in your drug box. Also, we recommend, and I think you would mostly agree to do this with anyone pregnant or otherwise having a seizure, checking an AccuCheck to make certain that the seizure isn't from hypoglycemia. Sometimes that can be arguably one of the very first signs of profound hypoglycemia is altered mentation and seizure. And then a little bit further down into the treatment, giving our IV midazolam is proven very helpful as well as I am, but now we also have intranasal midazolam administered through an atomizer. You guys have gotten good at that. And then repeating it again if the seizures either don't stop or recur. Of course, in any time you're treating seizures, making certain you suction the airway, provide oxygen, assist with ventilations, and never jam anything in the mouth. You guys are all experts at that. In fact, I'm proud to say that I can't remember the last time we've had that. You let the person get in that rescue position, give them oxygen, suction their mouth, and in this case, you can give, if you have no IV access, because your seizing can make starting an IV very challenging, go ahead and give five milligrams intranasal, IM or IO. It's a very effective way of treating it, and often their seizures will stop. We can all say what we want about Ativan or lorazepam versus midazolam. I will tell you, lorazepam might last a longer, but midazolam, in my experience, works faster, and you're actually gonna stop the seizures more quickly. And then, once again, 
being alert for hypoglycemia, and then being referred back to the treatment of necessary hypoglycemia if it's present. Sepsis 3.5. Wasn't a great deal that I found in here, but just monitoring the end tidal CO2. Yeah, and I know this is an additional burden for our friends that maybe like me that have been in practice a while. It wasn't typically your responsibility to check an end tidal CO2. But remember, part of the science of that is we're listening to the body's ability to ventilate or its need to hyperventilate, specifically in sepsis, in this case, where we're discussing someone who's likely has a metabolic acidosis due to their septic shock state, low tissue perfusion, low oxygenation of the tissues causes a anaerobic respiration in the cells, production of large amounts of lactic acid, which your brain realizes is present by having a lower pH, causes us to compensate for that by respirating more deeply and more quickly. And that hyperventilation will lower the end tidal CO2. It's kind of like a vital sign of shock. If we see the end tidal CO2 low, and then we help the patient with volume resuscitation, additional oxygen, supporting them from a circulation standpoint, their end tidal CO2 will reflect their respirations. And as their respiration starts to slow and return to normal, their end tidal CO2 will drop back in the 35 to 45 millimeters of mercury range. But again, it's a low number that indicates the body is compensating for a metabolic insult. And by monitoring it, we know how severe in some cases that insult is. Well, we get the return of an old favorite. <laughs> Protocol 3.6, hyperactive delirium syndrome with severe agitation. Everyone who knows me and has heard me talk about this thinks that we have to primarily, in this case, be thinking about protecting our providers. And you fortunately are in a MCA where that is an absolute imperative. You have the drugs on board to protect yourself. But I wanna remind everyone that while they've added a bunch of words to hyperactive delirium syndrome or the old version of agitated hyperactivity or excited delirium and excited agitated delirium, all those words really reflect a, usually an ingestion of a substance. Remember, this didn't exist until we had things like K-Spice and K2 and new versions of PCP. These are not always patients with a mental health disorder. Often, they're kids at a rave party time. These are physically dangerous, both to themselves and to those trying to help them. Agitated, delirious, sometimes combative and incoherent. But again, they're not schizophrenic. We have chemical restraint for the schizophrenic some, not many, but some schizophrenics become very physically aggressive when they're off their medicines and they feel threatened, they feel cornered, and they'll lash out at anybody, even people they love and care about. Then they go into the chemical restraint. This is more for your ingesting patient, 25-year-old from the rave party who's already punched two cops, and I don't want him to punch any of you folks, but you have the right medicine. You don't need to use ketamine. It's unfortunately, I think in this particular protocol, the, the alternative that we did not select for MCA has a history of both being effective and sometimes too effective. Whereas midazolam, 10 milligrams for an adult, is a great dose to slow them down, but not a big enough dose that you're gonna wind up assisting their ventilations. There are patients, regrettably, that'll get four milligrams per kilogram of ketamine. If I'm a 100 kilogram man, so if you give me 400 milligrams of ketamine, and I have other substances on board, I could vomit, aspirate, choke, and become an absolute airway nightmare. So midazolam isn't really associated with that. It has a rapid onset. Your ability to control them and not get hurt yourself will be enhanced. And the actual time of onset is almost the same between ketamine and midazolam. So please protect yourselves, protect the officers, use midazolam, safety first. And then we have a new protocol, the crashing adult impending arrest protocol 3.7. What's this protocol all about? You know, we've recognized in emergency medicine and lately in EMS that just focusing on airway breathing circulation may not be far enough upstream. There may be people that before they are to the point where we have to intubate them or do CPR, we can intervene in ways that will make CPR and intubation less likely and sort of buy them time. 
We still think about things in airway breathing and circulation, but you'll notice that a lot of the words in this are sort of discerning, do you really have time? And if their GCS is less than six, they go right into the airway management for breathing. If their chest isn't rising and falling, their saturations are below 90%, give them oxygen, but be prepared to assist their ventilations with positive pressure ventilation. When we get to the point that we've checked those boxes and the person does have a good saturation, but still looks unstable, they're diaphoretic, their blood pressure is low, we obtain vascular access and their shock state isn't improving just with their first fluid bolus. We have additional medications and these are very commonly used in the emergency department we have the ability to give them small intermittent doses of epinephrine. Specifically, take your cardiac epi, that's the one that has one milligram, a thousand micrograms, one milligram in 10 cc's. Remove one cc out of that cardiac syringe and put it in a syringe with nine cc's of normal saline. That mixture will give you 10 micrograms per ml and you can give small doses, one to two cc's every few minutes that will support blood pressure, cardiac output, it'll support heart rate. Think of it like a good drug for that patient that looks like they have a dying heart. Not so much epinephrine, not the whole milligram like we would if they were in cardiac arrest, but really 10 one thousandths of that in small doses that'll stimulate the heart, give them both alpha and beta effects, that's heart rate, blood pressure support, vascular resistance component, but not enough to throw them into a hypertensive crisis, which will undo everything you're trying to do. It is really great too, if you think you're gonna to have to give somebody in like our case, support their blood pressure with Levofed or norepinephrine drips, we'll use this to buy a time. And it's a very easy drug to both mix and give. Every three to five minutes, giving one to two cc's can have a profound effect that supports them while you're getting everything else ready. You'll see on the protocol, these intervals, in the first five minutes and 15 minutes and 20 minutes, please don't handcuff yourself to those intervals. These are suggested. And in fact, what they don't want you to do is, well, I can't do this until it's been 20 minutes. That's not true. But what they're saying is these are things that typically occur as a patient is starting to circle the drain within 20 minutes. And you'll see them need additional fluids. You'll see them need push dose epinephrine or additional vasopressors like dopamine and norepinephrine. It's just that the guidelines of the time intervals are to be thought provoking, but in no way are you limited. You can give things before the interval, and if it's already been 20 minutes, but now it apparently is needed, you can give it after. You're not wrong, and nobody's gonna criticize you for doing one of these interventions at 18 or 21 minutes. That's not what the protocol intends, even though if you read it, it kind of looks like you're a little bit boxed in by the intervals. You're not, and you'll never be an RMCA. This is a really good education protocol. And that's what we really want it to be is education, not something you're going to use in the present moment while you have this patient. It's too much to read. And it doesn't give a lot of if this, then that. I think it's just understanding you have additional tools for the patient that's unstable. But if they have a return of circulation and they're in shock, even though their heart's now beating and feel a pulse, you can give them small, these microscopic doses of epinephrine and really benefit them while their heart is getting out of its hypoxic state and shaking off some of its own lactic acid and starting to conduct pulses even more effectively. This can be a really great way to support them in that vulnerable interval right after return of circulation. But Bonnie, I like what you said. There's a lot of training and philosophy, if you will, in this. There's really just a better way of thinking about it as I have additional tools that I can give before I'm doing CPR again. And don't hesitate to make yourself available, no matter what the time interval is. Well, that's the end of section three. Thank you, Dr. McGraw. Thank you, Bonnie, for helping us with this education so that the providers know the changes. Thank you. Thank you so much, both of you guys. Thank you for joining us for section three. We'll see you in section four. Have a great day.